A little bit about myself. So I've got my Twitter, my email, blog information at the bottom. I do have a link at the end with the slides and two versions of the code, the before and after version. On the techniques we'll look at, you can use on any type of website. I happen to be ASP.NET, C Sharp. I use IIS, work on an e-commerce site, so that's kind of where my background is. I'm more concerned you know that the technique exists, and since we use all different technologies, I'm not going to show exactly how to set the things. So just be aware, focus on what the things are rather than how you light them up. So for performance rules, I used to work on compilers. And so when I looked at performance years ago for our site, I was really thinking it would be C sharp server side, you know, writing different loops, where I declare things, that sort of thing. Uh, Steve Soders came out with an excellent book back then, and he basically looked at a lot of sites, and 80 to 90% of the time people spent on sites were waiting for page resources, so images, JavaScript, CSS. Most sites, it's not optimizing your server-side code. I'll show you how you can tell if that is what your problem is, but for most sites, that's not the typical problem. We're going to focus on three different things for performance. The first is I want to make fewer HTTP requests. And I'll show you. I put it in italics only because HTTP2 changes those rules slightly. So I'll talk about that as we get there. You want to send as little as possible. And you also want to send it as infrequently as possible. So when I look at techniques later, I'll map them back to those rules. I'm going to use Fiddler throughout the talk. Uh, so Fiddler is a tracing tool built specifically for HTTP and HTTPS. How many people use it? Quite a few. OK. So there's two different versions. There's Fiddler Classic. I'm going to be showing Fiddler everywhere, which is cross-platform. And that's where they're putting all their new investment and work. So you'll see newer features there now. i have got a site here. So I made a site that should look identical before and after. So I'm just going to open up Fiddler. OK, so now that I have that started, it's going to trace everything. A little note, I do have some filters here, hopefully, if they didn't disappear. Nope, they're still there. So I am filtering out some of the things, because as soon as I turn on Fiddler, it's telling Windows, in this case, that I'm a proxy. I'm running here. If you have HTTP traffic, route it through me. A lot of things on your machine are going to end up getting routed through there. So I want to be able to focus on what I want. So I've got those filters set up. I've got a before and after. So we'll look at the before. I am not a designer. Uh, I took Bootstrap. I found a theme that I liked, a uh, fictional travel site. So I've just got some different places. I went to Australia. You can actually walk up that bridge up to the top. I found out my dad was afraid of heights that day, which I probably should check before. I'm just going to mark where we're at here. But the first tool I like to come in, I'm just going to mark this as orange so I can um, separate my before and after. So I like to come into here because I know the techniques that I'm looking for. So if somebody catches me somewhere and says, check out my site, I want to open up Fiddler and start looking at things because I'm going to look for specific techniques and things that we'll talk about during this talk. But the first thing we'll do here, I'm just going to select all of these. I'm going to look at these statistics. And I want you to focus on this part here. So it's about 13 requests. The average web page today is anywhere from 75 to 100 requests. And most pages these days are 2 to 3 meg. So this is almost 3 meg to get the page to look like that. So I want to pull up the after version here. I didn't use every technique that I could have. I just used quite a few of them. We'll just take a look at how this differs. So I'm going to select again from the bottom of the other one. And the important part here, it's down to 147k. So I took it from almost 3 meg down to about 147k. So if I were to go back to the before version, now the entire page is smaller than most of the images were individually on the other site. So that's just some of the things we'll talk about, where you're going to see those improvements. Again, we'll use Fiddler throughout, but I'd just like to use that as a baseline of how big is the page and are they using right techniques. There's a lot of metrics. So the first one I put in italics, so there's first byte. Uh, so that's you sent to the server, you got the first byte of the response. When we look at tools later, if your first byte number is a second or longer, you probably do have a server-side problem, right? You can focus then and say, I know something on my back end I could improve because I'm not getting that response back as soon as I should. 
Uh, again, it's unlikely that will be your problem, but if it, is, if it is, that's how you would know. I mark speed index, so there's literally tons of metrics. Speed index is what I've used for quite a few years. I'm gonna show you webpagetest.org. Uh, they actually came up with that metric. And it just gives me an idea of how many milliseconds did it take to paint uh, what they call the above the fold, the visible part of the viewport. There's lots of other ones we've had for years, timed, interactive, onload, fully loaded. I'm switching my focus now to Core Web Vitals. Uh, it came out a couple years ago, and the idea was they wanted better representative metrics of three things people care about with sites. So the first one is largest contentful paint. So when you show that above the fold, there's gonna be something that's the largest, usually a hero image or something like that. How long did it take to be visible? Because that's the indicator, indication to users that the page is almost done, right? They start to see that stuff. Next one is first input delay. I'm sure it's never happened to you, but I've gone to sites, I see it, I wanna start clicking on things and things don't work, right? Even though I can visually see it, the JavaScript and stuff is still processing, I can't get work done. So that's what first input delay does. Also probably never happened to you, but if you've been to websites where you pull up the site, you're about to click something and everything moves and shifts around, that's really irritating, that's cumulative layout shift. So just having these metrics lets us focus on the three important aspects of the page. And the nice thing is, so I work with marketing people, business people, I would tell them metrics in the past and they just, they didn't care. They actually came to me and said, what are our core web vitals? Because they hear that search engines are using them. So it's been a good thing for us to be able to have the same things to talk about, if that makes sense. Next thing I want to talk about is how to measure. So I'm gonna show you webpagetest.org. We're gonna use Fiddler throughout as well. So I'll just show you what that tool looks like. So this tool just exists for me to be able to go out. It's got a bunch of different uh, cities around the world. And I can just actually go pick and choose uh, where I wanna run from. Do I wanna run as a mobile or as desktop? This is not terribly fast, there we go. So I can come down here, I can just put in a URL and I can get into the advanced tab if I want to, but I can just pick these various places, different speeds. Uh, we'll talk about Lighthouse later. So it's got a lot of things I can do, it's free. I pre-ran this because I didn't want you to sit and wait for that. Sometimes you can get queued up behind stuff. So I wanted to show you, this is the before version. So if we just start looking through it, it's got some summaries up here about how it thought my page went. Here are the metrics. So if I start to focus on this, you can see my largest contentful paint. It was almost 1.8 seconds before you could see a lot. You can see my cumulative layout shift uh, gets a red. So there's a green, yellow, red for how well they feel you're matching up with Core Web Vitals. So they said it's shifting too much. And my, uh, in this case, total blocking time is pretty good. So I can look at any one of these individuals now. I'm gonna look at some of these waterfalls. I'm gonna close this for a moment. I don't know why it's not showing me my little waterfall diagram. How many people have seen waterfall diagrams and understand how they kind of work? Okay, so very similar to other tools. I'm just gonna start at the top here. I asked for my, in this case, ASP.NET page. It took a little while to connect and get going. I like that it starts to indicate here that this, these are blocking requests. So these JavaScript files, it's waiting for those to get downloaded and executed before it's going to do, continue doing anything. So it's just telling me, focus on those because how those are behaving is blocking my whole experience. And as I go down here further, you'll see these long purple lines correspond to images. So I know when I look at this, that images are something I have to focus on because they're taking a while to get downloaded, okay. And then we can look down here for a connection view, HTTP 1.1, it's been around forever, since the late 1990s, very successful. When the first came out, they said, we're gonna let you have two connections per host. So if I have a host and I've got a bunch of files there, I can only do two at a time. Uh, the browser vendors realized if they cheated and did more than two, they looked faster than other browsers. So most of them eventually ended up with six. So you could have six connections per host. So you can see the bad news with HTTP 1.1, which my before is using, is it had to open up six separate connections. And that takes a while, setting up the TCP, TLS, that sort of stuff is not quick. So we'll look later why this is better in the after version. So we'll pull that up here. And we've got our summaries up top again, and I'm gonna focus on the core web vitals parts here. Uh, 
largest contentful paint now is about half a second. There's no shift and there's no wait for the JavaScript. I do want to show you one other thing I forgot. When I show this to marketing people again, sometimes they just glaze over with all the numbers. I like that it has a video. So I don't know why, but showing them a video. So this is the before version. You know, we're already into two seconds. It's still pulling in some images. It doesn't look really complete until about 4.7 seconds. So I show them that, and then I can do the same thing here. We'll look at the after version. You can see the difference in a second. So compared to four, almost five seconds, and it gave me the impression the whole time that it wasn't quite done. The stuff was painting weird. Uh, this just, at a second, it all appears and they can start to use it. So this is very compelling to show to them because it just uh, visually makes more of an impact on people that don't use numbers a lot. There's two different kind of ways to measure. Uh, there's synthetic monitoring. So synthetic just means I hire a service that watches my site uh, all the time. So they hit certain pages from certain places. That's synthetic, right? It's not an actual customer of mine. I like synthetic though, because if I make a change to my server this weekend, I'll see you next week, I can compare apples to apples, right? I know it's the same computers that were used last week. I can see exactly what my perf did. However, I do also want to use real user monitoring. So a couple years ago, I listed the browser standards down here. Uh, there are companies now that will watch every one of your customers' requests and send them back to the server. So now I, I use both of these pieces of data. So I can hone in on an individual customer if they send to us and say, hey, we had performance problems. I can go look at their real user monitoring and see exactly what they waited for. Uh, and I also get good aggregate data. And I know that that's true customers with all sorts of bad connections, uh, old devices. So you really want to use both of those two things. And there's a lot of different vendors that do those things. I'll show you a couple as we go. Is it good enough? So this is a good question to ask. I could spend my whole life doing performance tweaks on my site. Um, I need to sell things, right? That's my main business site. We're an e-commerce site. So you have to decide, <clears throat> does your web performance impact your sales? So both Amazon and Walmart decided they would do A-B testing. If you've done that before, split half you people up. They said, we're gonna slow up half of the group just by 100 milliseconds, so one-tenth of a second. And both of them, curiously, ended up losing 1% uh, of their sales. So literally, you know, 100 milliseconds slower cost them 1%. I've been trying to convince my business to let me do that. I would love to A-B test my site, because then every time somebody comes with, hey, we need a new font, I could measure how much slower it would be, and I could, then it's all math. Right? And they understand, I, I could tell them, I know you want a new font, I know you think it's important to your brand, you're gonna lose X amount of money, is it really worth that? Right? It's a totally different discussion when you get it to, if I knew that number, so I would love to be able to do that someday. Um, the other thing you should do is compare yourself with your competitors. So unfortunately, I've been doing internet forever, and many, many years ago, somebody made the statement that websites have to be within two seconds, right? If you ever heard that, you know, they have to get the page within two seconds. Not terribly realistic with all the devices and, and the types of sites we're writing today. So Speed Curve is a RUM vendor that gives us free access to some of their data. So you can come out here and look. So I'm in retail. And I just want to show people if you're on a slow connection, retail, I'm going to look at the speed index. And these are major sites, right? We've got Target, we've got Amazon, uh, Walmart, all of these sites. And you can see that for all of them, you're at about five or six or even longer before you even see parts of the page. So it's just useful to set some context because people have expectations that no matter what, it should be X number of seconds. You can just show them that, you know, realistically we're in the same ballpark as these other major vendors. Like I said, you know, you've got to get work done, so don't just do things to do them. Make sure that it makes a difference for you. So every time I'm doing perf stuff, I get a web page test, I save it. They keep that for a long time, so I can go back and compare. I do whatever I'm going to do, and then I test it again. Because people tell me to do something, they say it worked great for them, it may not work for me. Or even times when I found out I tested it and it was 20% better, but it was hard to implement. Uh, we chose not to do it, but at least we know. So it's important that you measure the things you're changing. 
So that's kind of the background quickly. So now I'm just going to start hitting techniques. Uh, I, I have them pretty much stacked in the order of very important, but also very easy uh, to take advantage of first. And then it gets progressively harder to take advantage of. HTTP compression. So when you go to a website, all the major browsers support this today. The browser says, I know how to do compression. Uh, Gzip, Deflate, or the newest one is called Brotly. And all it's doing is taking your files and making them smaller through different compression techniques. Minnesota, uh, we're a rural company, so we could not get enough bandwidth into our building to support our site years ago. So we started scrambling for what can we do, and this was when compression was pretty early. We turned on compression, and the next day we cut our bandwidth usage in half, which is a big deal when you're constrained that way. And then we also noticed that our synthetic was 25% faster. So we turn this on again, uh, something for you to take advantage of. It's really simple to set up. I'm just gonna pop into Fiddler here again. I'll show you where you can tell if you're using compression or not. And you'll use it for most of your static files and they'll like the um, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, those all compress really well. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna hit after. I'm just going to hit Control F5 when this comes up. Let's see if it actually recorded it or if it's cached. OK, so I can go on any of these individual files. So if I look at, for instance, this, I can pop in here and it will show me here uncompressed and the size of it when it is compressed. So I can just kind of pop through these and see what a difference in the encoding. So here it's about 37K. And it was originally about 160K. So that's a huge reduction just by saying I want it to be compressed on the server. Okay. So the next one is content expirations. So the idea is if you come in my, and visit my website today, I'll run my ASP.NET page. I'm going to tell you here's my JavaScript, my CSS, my images, my fonts. If you come back tomorrow, what I want to have you do is I want you to hit my ASP.NET page because maybe something changed. But if nothing changed, I want you to pull all that other stuff off your own machine. I mean, browsers have caches on people's machines. I want to use what you have already cached. It's going to save me server load. It's going to save me bandwidth. And it's not going to be any faster for your customer than pulling it right off their own device. So the idea with this, like I said, you want to have just one. Uh, you'll notice that people aren't doing it because you'll see these, if you've ever seen this, if modified sense. Um, when you don't set your own expirations, the browsers are going to make up their own rules. They have all sorts of, each one is different, but they say, hey, I've got something in my cache. It's this old. They decide if they're going to go back to your server and ask for uh, fresher content or not. And I want to take that control back to my site and not leave that up to browsers. So I set specific content expirations. So I think for our images, we typically do uh, 30 days. And for our JavaScript and CSS, we do a year. And I'll talk about why we do it that way. I tell people this, and they say, that's great. But what happens if, uh, so let's say I have logo.svg today, the main logo of my company. And then tomorrow it needs to get changed. If it's sitting in people's caches and they're not going to come back and ask for the update, how do you deal with that? And basically, you just have to, you have to change the URL. There are lots of ways to do that. I could name it logo1.svg. Uh, the way we do it on our site, every image that we show on the site, uh, I'm creating a link to it with ASP.NET. So I'm actually using, there's a, in .NET, there's a thing called tick count. I can pull the tick count out, and it's basically the time it was changed, but a long number. I append that on the end of my image. So I just say, here's the image link, question mark, V equals, and the tick count. Or people use hashes, all sorts of things like that. But if you do that, you're going to get the best of both worlds. If it hasn't changed, it's going to pull out of their browser cache. It may, might not still be there if they go to a lot of places or it's been a while, but you're giving it the best chance to take it off their own machine. And again, that's how you break it is just by using the changing the URL. And again, what I'm looking for here in Fiddler, I'm looking at this caching column. And it's in seconds, unfortunately. So you'll see these kinds of numbers. That's a year. Etc. But you just want to double check that you're using caching appropriately uh, to take advantage of those things. 
Next one is a CDN. <clears throat> so I find this one kind of funny. So that it's not a joke. It actually starts with uh, two Google engineers are at a bar and they got into an argument. And they were arguing that bandwidth matters more or latency matters more. So bandwidth, if you ever talk to any provider, all they tell you about is the bandwidth. You know, it's 100 megabits per second, gigabit per second, whatever. Never really talk about latency. So if you go, I gave you a link there. If you go read the article, they took a site and they just gave it a little bit more bandwidth or they changed the latency. And if you measure it, latency is uh, anytime you make less latency. So latency is the time it takes to go from the client to the server and back. If you have less latency, that's always a bigger win than having more bandwidth. And they measured it. Again, this is for most sites. I'm not talking about Netflix and streaming sites. Most sites, when you get past about five megabits per second, it doesn't really help that much to have more bandwidth, just the way things work. Uh, so the focus should instead be on latency. I can't make you closer to my data center, right? My data center's in Minnesota. A content delivery network, they have a whole bunch of servers all around the world that are closer to my customers than I am, like where my data center is. So the idea is, I uh, use a CDN, I'll show you how I do it. I put all of my files on there, all the images, the CSS, the JavaScript. I host my web fonts there. I put that in italics because I actually had to send to the guy at web page test, uh, Pat Meehan, and say, why is this doing this with my fonts? Um, it created a separate connection on HTTP2 when it shouldn't have. And it's just something weird about fonts. So I'm probably gonna pull my fonts back into my main site to avoid that other connection. I, I don't know why they do that with fonts, but that's the only one that they do. So if I show you what this looks like for code, all I have to do differently is this is how I would normally reference images that exist within my own site. When I go to a CDN, they will give me a new subdomain, something like this, right? Whatever my domain name is, cdn.example.com. So now I change my references to all use that full URL. And the trick is when you are coming to my site, you need to resolve that name to an IP address. They give you back the IP address of the closest CDN server. So the first person in the room, if you happen to go to my site, nobody's been there before, and there happens to be, let's say there's a CDN server here in Boston, You'd go to the CDN, the CDN would say, I don't have this stuff. The CDN would reach out to me and bring it locally to that Boston server. And then everybody else who hits it is going to get it locally here from Boston. And that, what I like about it is it's easy to do. It's also really cheap compared to when we did it. I mean, there weren't that many players when we first started doing this. Uh, there's a lot of people that can give you CDNs for cheap prices. And again, it's just a latency game. You want to be closer to your customers so they don't have to wait to get all of your images and JavaScript and CSS. Uh, bundling and minification. So I put bundling there uh, in italics because again, that changes with HTTP2. But uh, how many people have seen minified files? I'm sure, okay. So I won't show you what one looks like. If you open up a file and there's no white space and it just, that's minification, you wanna do that. Uh, we minify all of our CSS and JavaScript. I know people do it for HTML. I've, I've heard a couple things. Sometimes it changes how things get laid out when you minify HTML. And I honestly have not found a good ASP.NET tool to do minification for me on the fly. So I just, I don't do it for HTML personally, uh, but I do it for all of our CSS and JavaScript. We also started this in HTTP 1.1. Uh, we talked about reducing the number of requests and latency and only having six connections per host. We actually took all of our JavaScript files and bundled them into a single file. So we bundle all of our JavaScript. We tack a version number on it. That's why I can set an expiration of a year because if I rebuild the site, something changes, it's going to override the cache and make you come back and get the whole thing. Uh, next day when we did this again, the home page was 46% faster. So about six hours of work, uh, lots of tools will do this. It made a huge difference to our performance. And like I said, the bundling part I'll come back to when we talk about HTTP2, whether you wanna do that now or not, but you should certainly minify. <clears throat> uh, next one, images, avoid them if possible. So here, you know, like I said, I've been, I've been doing this forever. Years ago, somebody said, I want this, designer says, I want a certain font on our site. Web fonts didn't exist, right? They would actually put the font in the, t you know, the font they want, and then they would 
capture that as an image, and then host that on the site. Or if you wanted gradients that wasn't available on the web, they would do it as an image. There's a lot of things you can use now in CSS3. Uh, the gradients, the web fonts, all that kind of stuff. Don't use images for those things when it's built into CSS. It's going to be a lot faster. Next is use the proper type. <clears throat> so today, so we do, uh, we're a responsive website. Most people probably are, where your site adjusts for the various breakpoints, the phone, tablet, desktop, SVG for logos. and. The reason is it's scalable vector graphics. You can have just a single SVG file, and it uses math to draw out the fonts. So no matter what the size is of the device, it's always going to be crystal clear because it's creating it off of equations, not off of bitmaps. If you're going to use a photo, I put JPEG. I'll give you some qualifications on that for a moment um, for photos. And I always get, there's a lot of people in the world who like to argue if you haven't been on Twitter and noticed that before. Um, but somebody said, well, why would you do that? You could do PNGs for images. I said, OK, well, here's my JPEG version of that bridge walk. That's about 60K. Here is the PNG version. And visually, it looks the same, but it's 10 times larger. Generally, you can compress JPEGs a lot better than you can PNGs. So again, don't argue with me. Try it. You know, Store it in the two formats, and look which one is smaller. If, if it happens PNG smaller, good for you. Uh, in general, it doesn't usually turn out that way, so use a JPEG. The qualifications to the JPEG recommendation is there are a lot of newer formats for photos. So WebP has got pretty good support now across browsers. AVIF, it was just announced Safari is going to finally support that this fall. And then there's JPEG XL, which makes super small images, and it's awesome, but not a single browser supports it, so I don't really have to care, right? Uh, but if you haven't been out to this site before, um, caniuse.com, how many people have heard of that? Okay, so can I use is cool because, pulled the wrong one there. It's cool because I can come out here and look for various supported things. So I, here's AVIF. I can just take my, you know, I'm a normal e-commerce site. I have to support a lot of different devices. I come out here and I notice that Safari doesn't support it, so uh, I don't care about IE anymore. Yes. I still have to support Edge, so I'm not going to go to AVIF yet. There's techniques that let me do both versions and target the whatever the browser supports. Again, that's all cool. Uh, I have a hard enough time getting our group to make the right six images as JPEGs that it's, this is not worth it for me yet. Eventually, I'll get to the point where I have good browser support, and I'm going to move to one of those. Next thing is to do responsive images. So when I first did responsive design, the knock was it's slow. And the reason people would say it was slow is you have to support a really high pixel density monitor like the one in the back there, right? It's going to look really nice. You have to have a photo that looks good on that, but you also want to support a very small phone. You don't want to use the same image. So what people did, there was you had one image tag. So what you had to do was support the largest one so it looks OK. That's the worst one to send to a mobile device. So the community actually came together, came up with source set and picture, and then got the browser vendors to support those. So I use source set. And I'll show you. It's easier to show you than say. So basically, for each image, I'll just pick on this one, I create various sizes. And there's all sorts of research about you know, what you want to do. I just took a, a one that worked for me and just doubled it all the way up the stack. So I have five different versions. So all I have to do is say source set, ignore the data dash for a moment. I say source set equals here are the images. And now the browser is going to look at everything. It can look at connection speed. Uh, resolution, whatever it wants to look for, and it picks the best image for use in that case. Uh, I'm kind of a control freak, so I didn't like that when I first did it, but I've been doing that for years. I put the width right in the, the file name, because in logs, then I can see how many people are requesting this size versus this size. It helps me alter what sizes I might want to support. And the picture, I'm not going to show it here. Picture is for um, art direction where you see maybe a whole scene on a desktop, but it kind of crops in on something smaller, that's where you'd use picture. Or if you want to support WebP, AVIF, and JPEG for the same place, picture lets you do that as well. Okay. But that is images. So I've come back to JPEG. 
So you can compress JPEGs and get a good trade-off between size and quality. So without fail, every time I say this to a designer, they just they freak out. Right? It's like you can't, no, you have to have the best quality image. So I finally had one of my designers and I were going round and round about it, so I made a deal. I said, I'm going to put up a page, I'm going to compress it differently. If you can pick the one that's the original that you think you need to use, I'll let you use that. And if not, you'll let me use mine. Fair enough. So I went and made this. So I threw in some, you know, I gave him some really crappy ones, so it was going to be easy. But if you hone in on these last five, it's not real easy to tell, even side by side, which one is the best and which one I want to use. So it turns out this is the best. It was 172K. The one right below it is 32K. That's a huge difference. And any tool, uh, Photoshop, I use PaintShop Pro, open up a JPEG, they just have a slider and they show you the two versions of the images side by side and you can just play with it. Um, we actually batch up all of our images in Photoshop, so they create all the sizes we need. So we just chose what is generally a good compression level that works across most of our photos so that we could just run that all in a batch. And then occasionally, if we have to, we'll go do it by hand. The other thing is progressive JPEGs. So I used to work in the modem years, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to go into the network tab here and make this be slow 3G because I want to show you these two paint. So if you look at this paint, watch when this comes in. There's going to be two, the same image. So if I do that again, the worse the connection is, the more you'll notice this on a really bad connection, the one on the right, hit control F5, the one on the right will just be painfully going line by line. Most people's JPEGs are the ones on the right. They're called baseline JPEGs. Um, they literally paint line by line. Progressive, which is on the left, will bring it into focus slowly. So it'll show the whole image right away, and then it slowly makes it higher quality. And when you, it, again, it's not great to show you the connection difference here, but if you're on a slow connection, that, that paint just kills you. They end up being the same file size, um, so we're looking at going back to progressive just because we have people on varied connections. We think it'll be a better perceived performance for them, if that makes sense. Um, the last one, if you didn't know this, when you take photos on your phone and such, it puts your lat long in there. Uh, all that extra metadata can waste space. So just, I use a tool called JPEG Tran, and we run all of our stuff through that. So if I look at the before, I'm going to pick like this guy. If you ever go into the details here, you'll see, of course, that one doesn't have it. Um, it usually has like the shutter speed, what camera I used, all that kind of stuff. JPEG Tran, I can just run on the command line and it strips all that stuff out. So it just saves you more time and it doesn't impact the quality at all. The next thing we did, we were uh, on a frozen food site. Uh, you go to our ice cream category and we have maybe 70 products in there. We used to do paging. We'd see the first 15, you'd go to page two, page three. The designer said, let's just have it all fit on one page. And I said, that's great. But they may download a whole bunch of images they may never look at. So we, did, we decided to do lazy loading. Um, I happen to still use that plugin. There is native support that just came in like last fall, but it's not everywhere yet. So again, I'm going to stick with my JavaScript till it gets implemented better. But if I go back to, that's what this data dash trick is. Anyone that is not above the fold, so I look at every image. If it's above the fold for my largest breakpoint, I don't do this because you don't want to lazy load something that you want them to see right away. If it's below the fold, all I have to do is put data dash source set. And then at the bottom here, I include that JavaScript file here. So what that does is it, it does not try to download them. The browser sees that data dash and it says, I, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to do it. So it just sits there. As soon as you start to scroll, that plugin will say, this guy looks at it like he's about to come above the fold. It copies data source set to source set. And then the browser kicks in and asks for all the images, if that makes sense. So I won't show you. You can see it in Fiddler. You just run it. Um, see the initial, I can mark it, and then as I scroll down, you'll see it's going to slowly bring in more and more images. So it's just, 
it's a trade-off of I want your main page to paint really quickly and as you scroll down these images will just come into view next thing we'll talk about is deferred loading so I took that same idea with lazy sizes we have a lot of uh, third-party things we use on our site I don't want those third parties being slow to ever impact my main site and so I'll warn you this is my own code I'll show you how you can do it um, differently with some things that are built into JavaScript but the idea is I've got um, my page set up you've got this onload event right here I just have this JavaScript up here so when the page onload fires that's when I've got my HTML CSS the main important parts about my page page load will fire it'll come in here and it does the same trick we just talked about it'll take data deferred source put it in the source so everything that I do this way is intentionally shoved way late in my process so like this if this is a third-party JavaScript I don't want that to impact my loading I just change it to data deferred source and they're guaranteed to be after page load is done okay so we do this with virtually all of our vendors I had some complaints a couple weeks ago about our site people are saying I can't remove products from the cart I can't get through some of the checkout process so I use Fiddler I pinned down that it was a specific vendor and I made that vendor intentionally slow so you can do that in uh, Fiddler you can just drag over requests say, I want this to take 25 seconds and I could prove to the vendor that you are making my site slow when you are slow that's a problem so we just converted last Friday I, we usually do it all the time I don't know why we didn't we switched them to data deferred source and now they can't impact us anymore they're just going to run later in the process if you want to do something that's built in when you talk to most vendors they'll say use async or defer so these are two new things you could do in JavaScript recently so I've got my normal script tags if you didn't know this when you hit a script tag the browser is going to stop and it's going to download that JavaScript and run it before it continues so if I were to run this page right now and in Fiddler everywhere I just set up some rules to make my JavaScript intentionally slow so I've got various slownesses here and if we look at this code if I go to run this you'll see what the user experience is like Oop. did not have that turned on apparently well, those are all on I'm gonna try that again what should happen I'm gonna hit control F5 here when it's done why are you not there okay so I don't know why it's not blocking the first one it's gonna sit here and wait now but the important thing is you're not seeing any of my content all my content is being held because it's waiting for those JavaScript files to download so every vendor in the world that you ever talk to probably says put us first in the head because we're super important right and then you tell them well you could hurt us and they say oh, okay put on async what async does is it tells the browser I don't I don't affect the paint so please let me be downloaded in the background the problem is as soon as they're done downloading they still run so if they run slow they're still hurting me and that's why I use the deferred technique I talked about before before uh, but if I tack async on here it'll do that uh, the other thing to know about async is it doesn't keep your source order anymore as soon as that file's done downloading it's going to run so if you need like if that were jQuery as the first one and then plugins I need jQuery to be there first use defer defer keeps them in source order and it actually moves them a little later in the page life cycle so I use these but rarely I like to use my own deferred because I want them to run as late as possible there's also resource hints let's take a look what those look like so these are things you can tell the browser that you're going to need this DNS for this host later so just start it as soon as you can so for you to give it to you in code I put it as meta tags uh, I would focus on ones like pre-connect so all this is saying is that I know later I'm going to go out to ajax.microsoft.com in the background start that connection start the TLS handshake all that stuff might be done by the time I get to the actual JavaScript file um, you can actually set these as response headers and that's how I would do it in production so as soon as the page gets served that goes down to the browser so the browser doesn't even have to start parsing it just sees a response header for pre-connect it starts making that connection don't do this with all the resources on your page I mean people have gone then and said I'm just gonna make them all a pre-connect this will be it. no 
So selectively, like I would do it for my CDN. I actually tried it for my CDN and it turned out that my other requests were so close to the top of the page, it really didn't give me the benefit that I wanted. So I, I just chose not to use it, but um, other people have had really good luck with that. A couple other things. So I really focus on critical rendering path. Uh, so I want stuff to paint right away and be available. I'm gonna warn you that URLs are case sensitive if you didn't know this. So I'm gonna clear out Fiddler here and I'll show you the... I've got the exact same image referenced three different times with different cases. And if I go run that thing, and I go into Fiddler, you'll see it requested it three times. Now, I'm not gonna code a page where I've got it back to back with different things, but we found as developers, I like camel case. The other person liked all lowercase. So we were doing all these expirations and all this cool stuff. Go to my page, you get the logo, you go to his page and it would have to re-download it all again, which is a waste. So if you didn't know that, so we just made the rule that all of our, all of our URLs are lowercase. Just made it easier for us. I won't talk too much about these. The font subsetting, um, our company was acquired by a uh, Korean company. And at the time, they said, go out and put on the home page of the site this little blurb. And they gave me a font to use. And I took the web font. It was like 2 meg. Like, this is a 2 meg font file. I'm not going to put that on our server. So I went out to, I think it was Font Squirrel. And you can actually look in there. And it was because all of the Asian glyphs were in that font that I didn't need. So I actually subset it. I took it from a 2 meg font to a 28K font, which made me much happier. And so and the last one, TLS 1.3 is a security thing, right? It's better HTTPS. It's got uh, better algorithms, et cetera. It turned out when we turned on TLS 1.3 in our CDN server, our pages got 20% faster. TLS 1.3 has less connection setup time. So not only is it more secure, it turned out to be 20% faster. It's not very often you can click a thing on a configuration and get 20%. So I would recommend you do that for those two reasons. HTTP 2. Um, Lots of things about HTTP2. I'm going to focus on that fully multiplexed connection. So they said, we're not opening six connections anymore, which is going to open one connection per host and multiplex everything over that one connection. So when they did that, all the tricks I was using in the past to make things um, work better, like making less requests to manage these precious six connections that I had went out the window. I don't need to do that anymore. So I listed some techniques that I've used over the years, other people use. Um, bundling, there's been a lot of arguments about bundling. I bundled everything before, and people are saying don't swing to just not bundle anything. Uh, it's probably best to have several smaller bundles with associated JavaScript files. So again, test it out for yourself. It's not like it was hard for me to bundle, but if I did change one line of JavaScript, your whole bundle got invalidated. So I want to move to the world where now that we use HTTP2, I want to test out and see, should I not bundle anymore? And I won't go through the rest of those because we're getting short on time. I do want to show you some cool tools. If you've used this before, you can go into, and I'm going to go to the before version here. If you hit F12, eventually when this thing comes alive, let close. Okay, if I hit F12, there's a tab on here called Lighthouse. And if I do it, it has a lot of built-in intelligence about things like performance. I'm just going to go run this. It's going to look at my page and look for certain techniques. And it's going to give me, first of all, a score, uh, 0 to 100. But then it's also going to list out all the things I should change. So all the stuff we just talked about, it will mention. So I got a 54 out of 100, not horrible. It gave me some of the core web vitals here again. But then down here, it starts telling me all the stuff we've talked about. Use HTTP2. Uh, compress your images. Do compression. Uh, look for render blocking resources where you want to use async and defer and stuff. Minify your JavaScript. Minify your CSS. So again, it's just everything we went through, it's built in where you can go find out. And then if you don't know what those things are, they have links where you can go out and read articles about, you know, I don't know what you mean by compression. How would I do that? What does that mean? So I'm going to pull up my after version here. We'll just run that again. We'll cross our fingers. Come on. It was 
a hundred the other day. That's sad. So anyways, I can come down here. There's still some things I need to do. Um, the reason, oh, that's why. I have Fiddler open. Fiddler Classic does not support HTTP2. Fiddler everywhere does, but it's a, you have to light it up and I don't have it lit up, lit up here. So we'll see if I can get my hundred back from that. But, and then there's people who went out and purposely made pages that would score a hundred, but suck, right? They're still slow. That's not the point. Yes. Um, I actually use this in like my annual performance reviews. It's part of my thing as a metric that people can follow that's easily measurable. Can I make that move from one number to another and, and show that we're improving our performance? So that's kind of cool. So I am a plural site author. I do have a full course on web performance. If you want to see some of the how do you do these things, the image one, two goes, here's PaintShop Pro. Here's how you do the compression, all that kind of details. I have a, my most recent is debugging your website with Fiddler and Chrome developer tools. So basically, this doesn't work on your site. Which one of those two or both is the appropriate way to troubleshoot that problem? And then I have an advanced Fiddler one that just goes into all sorts of details for Fiddler Classic. So that, that is my Twitter, my email, my blog. That's the link to the slides and the code. Again, you'll have the slides and then it'll just be performance before and performance after. And again, I didn't do everything I could have in the after version. I just did some of the easy ones, uh, but you could see the improvement that we saw earlier. So with that, um, that's all I had. I'm gonna be around the rest of the day. If you wanna ask any particular questions or follow up on any of those channels will work. Uh, so that's all I had. So thanks for coming.